We're going to go ahead and let our kids head back to class. Uh, they can make their way back there for class time. As they do that, I'll share with you just kind of a weird thing that happens to screen game in your life. But it was a way as kind of kids were trickling in late to kind of just have some fun and be silly. And you'd, way back in the day, they were all on PowerPoint, you know, sometimes. And they, they move forward with that. But we'd, we'd throw different things up, different quotes. Or can you picture this movie scene? What movie is it from? One of the, not best, but one of the weirdest games that we ever played was a game called Animix. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you what Animix looks like today because I just want you to have nightmares later on. So the game is pretty simple in its premise. It asks the question, what do you get when you mix a tiger and a squirrel? Now you might expect some punchline or something clever. No, what you get is exactly what you think you'd get. You get a tiger that looks kind of like that. The stuff nightmares are made of, right? It gets better. So what do you get, you suppose, when you mix a shark and a seagull? A shark gall, right? And it looks something like this. There's something wrong about that, isn't it? One more. What do you get when you mix a whale and a penguin? This one's actually kind of cute. It's not terrifying. Yeah, you get a whale gun. It looks like this. There are some things in life that just shouldn't be mixed, I suppose. Uh, just kind of a weird thing that I was thinking about because we're going to read through Psalms 110. And Psalms 110 does something kind of unique and different. See, for so many of the ancient religions, uh, whether it be uh, Babylon or Persia or the Egyptian pharaoh, the, uh, the role of king and the role of priest were intermixed, okay? That the king was, he was the legal king, he made the laws, he governed the land, he spent the money, he was the military leader, he commanded the armies, he drew up the battle plans, and he was also the religious leader. He designed where temples were going to be built. He often helped in worship or made sacrifices at certain ceremonies. And he hired the priest or appointed the priest. And he was the ultimate religious authority as well. And so for many of these ancient religions like Babylon and Persia, the people living in Canaan and Egypt, it was not uncommon to have a priest king, someone who served both roles, both the religious authority and the legal authority embodied in one person. But for the people of Israel, those didn't mix any more than a tiger and a squirrel should mix, okay? It was just wrong. In fact, when you read through the stories of the kings of Israel, one of the greatest crimes one could commit is a king trying to be a priest. One of my favorite stories is the story of Uzziah. If you don't know this story, here's the basic outline. Uzziah was a really good godly king. He defeated the enemies of Israel. He strengthened the army. He built fortifications. He established new cities. They were prospering. He was a king of the southern tribes in Judah. And God was blessing him. And because everything was going well, as is often the case with us, Uzziah went, look at me. I'm doing good. I'm, I'm a good dude. Instead of praising God, he made it about Uzziah. And so he decided one day that he was going to walk into the holy place and burn incense on the altar where only the priests were allowed to be. And despite being warned repeatedly, despite being opposed by Ahaziah and several of the priests of the day, he continued with his plan and was this close to actually pouring the incense on the altar when God struck him with leprosy. And Uzziah spent the rest of his days living in isolation, unable to attend worship, unable to fulfill his duties as king, because he refused to respect the fact that for Israelites... Kings and priests were not the same people. Kings were descendants of Judah, right? Descendants of David. The son of David will sit on the throne. The tribe of Judah is where you had to be. The priests were from the tribe of Levi, specifically descendants of Aaron. You couldn't be both, which is what makes Psalm 110 so interesting. So we're going to pick up reading in Psalm 110, starting in verse 1. So the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. We're going to pause for just a second, and then we'll keep reading, okay? From the earliest days of this writing, the Jews understood this passage to be written about the coming Messiah. And the reason is because of verse 1. The Lord declared to my Lord. So there are three people involved in this verse. Person number one, David. He's the one writing the psalm, okay? So David is writing the psalm. 
Then there is the Lord and there is my Lord. Two very different people. We know this because David chooses different words to talk about them. You'll notice even in the translation on the screen that the first Lord is in all capitals. That's because that's the Hebrew word Yahweh. That is the name of God. But the, but the Jews would never say the name of God. They would replace it with Lord. But David writes, for Yahweh declares to my Lord. Now that one's not in all capitals because that is the Hebrew word Adonai. Now Adonai sometimes refers to God. O Lord my God. And when in all, you know, we just sang that, right? Sometimes Adonai refers to God. But sometimes it refers to a king or a ruler or someone who's like Caesar would have been called Adonai by the people who considered him to be their Lord. And so a, a more literal translation is Yahweh, or God, says to Adonai, the Lord. And the reason they understood this passage to be messianic is because of this question. David is the king of all of Israel. Who would David call Lord besides God? Who else would David call his Adonai besides God himself? But he can't be talking about God because it says, God says to David's Lord. Therefore, it must be talking about the Messiah. And so they would read this passage sometimes at you know, a royal event, and they would talk about how God would bless the king. But they understood from the very beginning that this passage was a messianic prophecy, that one day David's master, the Messiah, would come, and Yahweh would say to Messiah these things. And so this is a passage about Jesus. And even before Jesus came, people knew that this was a passage pointing towards the Messiah. So the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And the Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Rule over your surrounding enemies. Your people will volunteer on your day of battle. In holy splendor, from the womb of the dawn, the dew of your youth belongs to you. Now all of this is typical messianic stuff, right? The Messiah is going to be king. They knew that. Okay? All the way back from when David was promised, listen, one day your son will sit on the throne and he will reign forever. Okay? David writing about this is not new. This is a picture of all of the great kings of Israel. And you have to imagine when Uzziah was winning all those battles, people wondered if this was about him. God was making his enemies his footstools. He was establishing his army. People were volunteering to fight for him. This could be a great king like Uzziah. You have to wonder when David was winning all of his battles, that perhaps he thought it was about him. That here David is defeating the Philistines and the Jebusites and establishing the capital in Jerusalem and his enemies are being made his footstool and people are volunteering. This is a picture of a military warrior king, which fits nicely with everything the Israelites were looking for in a Messiah. Someone to throw off those nasty Romans. Someone to beat back our enemies. Someone to sit on the throne. Someone to be clothed in glory and holy splendor. But verse 4 kind of takes a sharp left turn and messes with your head a little bit. It says, For the Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. Forever you are a priest like Melchizedek. Now that's kind of a weird verse for a couple of reasons. One, how can this guy who's the king also be the priest? Because that doesn't happen. You can't be both. You can't be from the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Levi. You can't be David's descendant and Aaron's descendant. Unless you think, you're think you thinking in your mind, well, what if his mom's from here? Then women didn't count during this time, okay? I hate to break it to you, but who your mom's family was didn't matter in your genealogy. It was all about your patriarchal family tree. You could only be from one tribe. How could this king, this glorious king who defeats all the enemies, who has all this power, who's clothed in holy splendor, how can he also be the priest? That doesn't work. In fact, they were so confused about it that when we read writings from the first century, we read that, that they, many people expected there to be two messiahs, that they would come and work together much the way Moses and Aaron had. That there would be the Messiah king who would have Moses' role, lead the people out of slavery, overthrow the empire, lead the people. And then there would be Aaron, the priest, who would make the sacrifices and make the people right with God. Because they couldn't fathom that one person could be both. Which is why we get mention of this guy, Melchizedek. Everybody knows who Melchizedek is, right? <laughs> oh, come on, you didn't learn that story in Sunday school class when you were three? Yeah, we skipped some of you. I got a few hands. He is one of the least mentioned 
and yet most important characters to understanding Jesus in the Old Testament. He shows up for less than 12 verses in Genesis 14, and he comes out of nowhere, and he disappears into nowhere. So the basic outline of the story in Genesis 14 is all of these kings are waging war against each other. There's nine kings. Melchizedek is not one of them. In fact, none of them have anything to do with the story other than the king of Sodom loses. And in the midst of that battle, the people of Sodom get taken captive. And the person in our story who's important to that is that Lot, Abraham's nephew, was living in Sodom at that time. And so Lot is taken captive. And Abraham gathers his forces and goes to rescue his nephew Lot. And on his way back, he meets Melchizedek in this valley. Melchizedek has nothing to do with the story at this point. He was not involved in the battle. He's never met Abraham before. We don't know his family tree. Here's what we know about him. He is the king of Salem, and he is a priest of the Lord Most High. That's all we know. He just appears out of nowhere. In fact, when C.S. Lewis is writing about this psalm, he says that Melchizedek gives the impression that perhaps he might not be from that other world, but he's definitely from another world completely disconnected from our story of the Israelite people, completely dis disconnected from the Abrahamic tradition. He's just this guy over here doing his own thing who's worshiping Yahweh, who for a brief moment steps into the story for a couple of key reasons. Number one, he is a king and a priest. And while there had been other king-priest combos, none of them had worshiped Yahweh. I mean, Pharaoh was a king and a priest, but he didn't worship God Most High. The leaders in Canaan were kings and priests, but they didn't worship God Most High. But here in Melchizedek, we have a man who is both king, ruler, full of authority, military leader, the one who brings freedom for his people, and priest, the one who stands between his people and God, the one who leads them in worship. He is both, and he's not just a king and a priest, he's priest of God Most High. And the second thing that's important is what Abraham does when he meets Melchizedek. For no apparent reason. He doesn't seem to owe him anything. Melchizedek has done nothing for him. Abraham decides to offer a tithe to Melchizedek. He takes 10% of everything he just won when he defeated the king of Sodom and offers it to Melchizedek. Which gives us a social ranking, right? Who is superior? The one who offers the tithe or the one who receives it? The one who receives it, right? The one who's, who we're being paid tribute to. And that's going to be important because what it means is that Melchizedek as a priest wasn't just another kind of priest from what the Jews were used to. He was a greater kind of priest. That hundreds of years before the Levitical priesthood came into being, hundreds of years before Levi was even born, hundreds of years before Aaron becomes the first Jewish priest, Abraham offers a gift a tribute to Melchizedek, the priest of God Most High. And so the reason that shows up in Psalm 110 is because if this Messiah is going to be both king and priest, he's not going to be a priest like all the Levite priests had been. He's going to be a priest like Melchizedek was. Someone who somehow, through God's declaration, rather than through inherited role, was both priest and king. And of course, we believe that Jesus fulfills both of these roles, right? That Jesus functions as priest and as king. In fact, the author of Hebrews will spend nearly four whole chapters explaining how Jesus can be the priest. And he's doing that because for a Jew, it was a really hard thing to wrap their brain around. And Hebrews is written primarily to Jewish Christians. That's why it's called Hebrews. They're the Hebrew people. And so he spends four chapters writing about Melchizedek. Chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7 is about Jesus as high priest in the order of Melchizedek. One of my favorite verses from that section is Hebrews 4, starting in verse 14. He says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. Do you know what the role of the priest really is? What it is that the priest does? 
So the priest does this. Over here is God in all of his divinity and perfection and holiness, separate from above, transcendent above people, right? And over here is regular, ordinary people, okay? With all of our sinfulness and brokenness and, and just faults and weaknesses and frailty and failures. And there's a gap between God and man. And the role of the priest, regardless of your religion, whether Christian or Jewish or Hindu or whatever, the role of the priest is to stand in the gap and to build a bridge to connect who God is with who the people are. Now, sometimes they do that through prayer. Sometimes they do that through sacrifice. Sometimes they do that through ritual tradition. Sometimes they do that through teaching. But they take who God is and they bring it over to the people. And they say, this is what God wants from you. This is how God expects you to live. This is the sacrifice you need to make. And then they take the people and all of their weaknesses and they bring them before God and they offer sacrifices and prayers to appease the God. That's been the role of a priest for thousands of years regardless of your religion. So let me ask you, who better to stand in that gap? Who better to build a bridge between God and man than the one who is both God and man? Who better to walk into the throne room of heaven and be our advocate and our intercessor than the one who has dwelt in the throne room of heaven since before the dawn of time. And who better to come and speak to our weakness and our frailty and our sin than the one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, who knows our weaknesses, who knows what it is to be human, who has walked in our shoes and yet has endured without sin. That passage we read in Hebrews basically says this, we have a great high priest who's perfectly qualified to stand in the gap because he has both been here and been here, and therefore he can stand and intercede on our behalf. Hebrews goes on to say that Jesus makes a sacrifice once for all, and then he sits down for his work is completed. The bridge has been established, and we may walk into the throne room of grace with confidence because Jesus is our great high priest, because Jesus has built the bridge upon which we walk, because Jesus has reconnected us to our creator. Jesus is the great high priest, but he's also the great king. Philippians chapter 2 puts it this way. It says that God also highly exalted him, him being Jesus, and gave him the name that is above every name, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, after his time on this earth, went back to heaven and was seated at the right hand of God where he was given the name above every name that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The king above all kings, the one whose dominion knows no end. If it seems like we've talked about this a lot in the last 10 or 12 weeks, it's because we have, and we're going to continue to as long as we walk through Core 52. Because as we walk through this Core 52 study, and he's pulling out all of these major verses and keys, you have to understand that the central theme of the Bible is that God is king. Like that, That's the central thread, is that God is king. In the garden, the reason the whole story starts is because Adam and Eve forget that God is king. And they think they can define right and wrong for themselves and they'll be better off without God as king. And everything that happens from that point forward leads us to Revelation 21 where there's a new heaven and a new earth and God comes down and he is the king and we are his people. That's where the story starts and that's where the story ends. And everything in between is about getting back to the point where everyone recognizes that God is our God and we are his people. He's the king and we are his people. And so we're going to see it, whether it uses the analogy of the good shepherd. Are you following the shepherd or not? Whether it's the vine and the branches, are you connected to the vine or not? Are are you submissive to the king? Are you obedient to the king? This language, we're going to talk about dominion in a few weeks, out of Daniel. Over and over and over again, this theme comes up in scripture. That God is king. That Jesus, the Messiah, is his prince. The prince of peace, the king of all kings, seated at the right hand, with a dominion that knows no end, with an authority that knows no bounds. As we have done throughout the series, I'm going to introduce you to a a more modern song. These psalms originally were sung. They were meant to be played. 
And so here's what it might sound like for someone today to proclaim the kingship of God and ever. You are the only king forever. It's interesting to me to, to preach this sermon today, right? Because this is a, the birthday of our nation is today, and we celebrate the fact that we overthrew our king, right? We decided we didn't like our king, and so we got our army together, and we told our king he could go away. We were going to rule ourselves. That's the origin of our nation. And I think it's fitting because I think there are many who that is their relationship with God, that they live in defiance to their king. They live in disobedience to their king. They live in outright rebellion against their king. And in their mind, they think somehow they're going to do what we did as a nation. They're going to throw him off, and they're going to have their freedom, and they're going to be able to go wherever they want. And I just want you to know that his authority is not up for debate. You don't rebel against him and win. There will be no revolution where Jesus is no longer king. He is the only king forever. His dominion knows no end. For those of us living in rebellion to our king, it's more like what happened to the Jews. In 66 AD, the Jews decided they'd had enough of the Roman king. That he was oppressive, the taxes were too high, he was offensive, he wouldn't let them worship the way they wanted. And it really the, came to a head, one of the governors of Judea went into the temple and took some of the temple stuff to pay the taxes that the people refused to pay. And so they revolted. And for about two years, things went really, really well. They slaughtered the Roman garrison in Jerusalem, absolutely slaughtered them. And the first reinforcements the Romans sent were about 6,000 troops. They slaughtered them too, absolutely annihilated them. You know what happened? You know what happens when you tick Caesar off? He doesn't send 6,000 troops. He sends 100,000. He sends multiple legions. He sends his best general, the one who eventually becomes the next Caesar of the Roman Empire when Nero passes away. And they come in and they march on Jerusalem and they burn Jerusalem to the ground. They knock down the walls. They destroy the temple. Josephus tells us that approximately a million and a half people died in the siege of Jerusalem alone. That doesn't count all of the other battles. Thousands of people hung on crosses. People starved to death. People burn at the stake. It was brutal and it was cruel because the Romans had a policy. You can rebel against us once, but we are going to be so cruel to you that you will never think about doing it again. And they crushed their rebellion. That may be a hard way for you to think about Jesus as king, but I want you to know that's what the Bible says. You have freedom to live in rebellion against him if you want. You're welcome to do that. He will not force himself on you. But there is coming a day when you will recognize that he is the authority. When every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And there will be consequences for your rebellion. And our only choice is do we submit willingly now to his authority and his kingship. You are Lord of my life. I will do whatever you ask. I will go wherever you go. I will do things that I don't understand. I will be obedient in ways that are hard for me. I will do those things. I will be obedient to you now. Or do we wait till then? Do we rebel and face the consequences? That choice is up to us. It is undisputed that Jesus is both priest and king. His role is established. The only thing up for debate is how you will respond to him, what choice you will make. And so I'm going to pray over us, and we're going to sing an invitation song, I Surrender All. And it becomes a prayer for us that I submit everything I have to the kingship of Jesus, that I recognize that he is on the throne, and I surrender everything I have to his authority. If you need to make that decision for the first time, or if you need to talk, or have someone pray with you, I'll be sitting in the front row. I'd love to do that with you. If you're watching online at home, send me a message. I'd love to pray or talk with you about what that looks like to surrender and submit to the kingship of Jesus. And for the rest of us, let this be our prayer, that I surrender my whole life and submit to his authority as king of the world. Father, we come into this moment. We recognize your greatness. We recognize your authority. We recognize that you are the king above all kings.
Father, may we use this song to repent of any rebellion that might be in our lives. To repent of those times when we have chosen to follow our own way. When we have chosen to live opposed to you. Father, may this be the prayer of our hearts as we surrender all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.